Good morning. Good morning. Glad that you're here at church. We're glad that you made it. How many people just as a show of hands have finished all of your Christmas shopping and you are ready to go? <laughs> high and fly it high. Come on, hold it up there. How many people have yet to get that last gift? How many people have not done any shopping at all? Be honest, we're in church. Okay. Awesome. How many people this Christmas are going to probably re-gift something? Yes. Likely. Can't wait for that to happen. Well, you know that we've, uh, we've just finished up our series on one this last year. We've gone through the Bible. If this is your first time at Gateway, we don't want it to be your last time. So if you could fill out the little communication card that's in the seat back in front of you and let us know that you are here today, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, but we've been going through the scriptures uh, all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We finished all that up. Last week, I've got some great news for you. We had uh, 19 kids uh, respond to the gospel uh, right here on Sunday morning, 19 kids, and another six here adults right here in the chapel. Amen? Awesome. <clears throat> What's really cool about that and, and interesting at the same time is that Perry Knorr, one of our, uh, he, he actually works on the facilities here in the grounds. He actually was the one to share the gospel last week with our kids, and uh, he actually went into the hospital yesterday had a heart attack, uh, but the Lord has spared him, and he's, uh, he's got a stint in his heart, and he's doing fine. You could be praying for Perry and Terry, okay? So Perry, if you're watching this morning, God bless you. We're praying for you. Amen? Amen. Many others, you've come with needs in your life today, and this message is just for you. We're going into the next couple of weeks. Hope has a name and wonderful counselor. You heard it read up here by the little kids, Isaiah 9. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and pull it out. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the chair uh, underneath your chair, and if, you, if there isn't one out in the, uh, in the courtyard, you can go on your phone. I'm letting you go on your phone right now, but again, some of you who are older, get off that word game or Angry Birds, and those who are younger, stop playing whatever it is that you're playing. Okay, and get on the Bible. All right, so we're in the Bible. We're going to go to Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, and eventually Hebrews 4, so I know that's a big gap. Just put, you got enough fingers, you can do that. And with your device, I'll actually get there. So again, we're going to look at a prophecy today that was actually given. It would take place 700 years. Ultimately, it would be fulfilled 700 years after it was given. So many people in our culture will have this obstacle when it comes to the Bible, right? And you've heard it, a common objection. The Bible is not relevant to my life. And they'll use things like this. The Bible just isn't relevant to my life. It doesn't really address real people, some will argue, with real situations. It's just a nice, sentimental book, and especially around Christmas time, it seems neat and everything. But many people will say this. You know, I, I like the quaint stories about Jesus, and we have one of those little manger scenes at home, but I've got real problems, and I need real solutions. I've lost my job. My marriage is a mess. I have chronic pain in my body. How can this little prophecy really help me? How can the Bible itself help me? Maybe some of you are saying, I just want my loved one back, and so when I'm around Christmas time, I, I have no joy. Look, people come with pain all the time. But again, some will say, Jesus, the story, it's heartwarming and all, but I don't live in that Hallmark movie on TV. That's just not my life. My life is real problems. I'm a real person. Well, is that you today? Do you feel like, ultimately, you need real answers to your real problems? Well, again, maybe you should turn to your neighbor. Maybe you feel like doing this. Uh, uh, I hate Christmas. It's bah humbug. Go ahead. No, just kidding. Don't do that. Okay? The, the idea here is, again, today you're going to see on the front, and I want you to see it, a misunderstood truth about Jesus. Jesus came for people with problems. This is good news for you. Jesus came for people with problems. Many people under, misunderstand this. And, and I know I've never really been guilty of being deep, by the way, in my sermons. It's really basic and fr pretty, pretty, at least for me, cut and dried. But let me give you something really, really deep. Now, think about this. Every miracle in the New Testament, when you read through all of those things, every one of them started with one thing. Started with a problem. Wow. Wow, and that's good news for some of you. Listen, sometimes it was hunger, sometimes it was poverty, sometimes it was brokenness, sometimes it was even disease or death. That was the problem. And in case you miss it, anything else that I say today, 
Jesus came for you in the midst of your problem. He came for people with problems, and that's good news. Hallelujah. Now, how many people are a candidate for miracle today? You may say, I got problems. I got all kinds of problems. I got all, I, some of you came in today and the, you were just singing, you know, Noel, 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 deck the halls with bells. I mean, the joy is in you and your warm little heart, but maybe that's not everyone here. Maybe you're trying to find that joy. You're trying to pick that back up in your life somewhere. By the way, if you have no problems at all, just call the church office. We will be glad to give you a problem. <laughs> we will be glad to do that. We've got lots of problems out there. Listen, no problem, no miracle. No problem, no miracle. If you've got a problem, you're a candidate for a miracle. Hallelujah. And I think God brought you here for a reason to hear this message. Don't check out. Please don't because there's hope for you and hope has a name. We're going to see it today. Wonderful counselor. So are you at Isaiah 7? Isaiah 7. You've been there. I've given you plenty of time to do this, right? You're still trying to find Hebrews, some of you. I understand, right? Again, there's a hope that God gives us. Hope has a name. God's greatest gift to us with his son, Jesus, that's what we're celebrating during Christmas time. This is one of the most famous prophecies about the Messiah. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. Now, we don't have time to go through all of 7, 8, and 9, so I'm going to take you forward to 9, verse 2. Chapter 9, verse 2. So move to the right to 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Verse 4. For as in the day of Midian's defeat... You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Verse 5, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Did you ever hear this before the next verse? You probably never heard that in context. We'll talk about it. Verse 6, here's the famous verse. For unto us or for to us, a child is born, a son is given, right? And the government will be upon his shoulders. Are you singing the song yet? Okay, and he will be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are like little duets here, right? Wonderful counselor. So counselor, God, Father, and Prince. All those others are descriptive of him. The first thing I want you to see about this prophecy is understand this. This prophecy was not given at Christmas time. All right, some of you remember this when we went through the Bible. It dated all the way back to 730 B.C. King Ahaz. Everybody say Ahaz. Ahaz. Wasn't a great king. He was kind of an evil king for Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. Ahaz was really nervous at the time because he was wondering how to defend himself against Assyria. Assyria was threatening to attack Israel. And so he's thinking, well, how do I defend myself? How do I create alliances with other countries so we can be defended? And he was nervous about this. So God sends a prophet named Isaiah. That's the book to tell him basically, I'm going to paraphrase, don't worry about the alliances, I will protect you. But that wasn't convincing enough for Ahaz. So again, Isaiah would say, look, I'm going to give you a miraculous sign. God's going to give it to you to prove that he will protect you. So verse 714 is the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel, which means again, God with us. Now I want you to pay attention to prophecy. Wake up. Don't fall asleep. If you need to go get some good coffee, it's right out there. Roger will tell you. Okay? Listen, uh, uh, ultimately when it comes to prophecy, there is a ultimate fulfillment, but there's also what we call a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. So some of you have seen like the Cascade Mountains or maybe even uh, the, the Sierra Mountains from a distance, right? It's been said like this. Prophecy, when you look at it from a distance, looks like one big mountain, one range altogether. But as you get closer to it, It's actually multiple mountains spread apart by miles. So the same is true when it comes to prophecy. It looks like one prophecy but for one time, but then there's a gap of time from the the first fulfillment to the ultimate fulfillment. As this day, like, why are you telling us this? Actually, contextually, we see in chapter 8 that there is a child that is born. 
But I want you to see this. The birth of Jesus deals with the root of our problem. This is why he's telling us this right now in Isaiah. Deals with the root of our problem, which is separation from God. Not just ours, but the the people of Ahaz's day as well, in Isaiah's day. All of our earthly problems ultimately stem back to a major, major problem. Now, that doesn't mean that whatever you're kind of in right now, that God is somehow punishing you for a specific sin, but it all goes back to God wants to fix our ultimate problem, which is separation from God. So, so again, what does he do? He sends a Messiah. But the problem is, is that there's something evil that's, you see it all the time. It's, it's in us. And uh, I, I know this is kind of nerdy, but uh, J.R. Tolkien, you know, there's, there's websites that you read all about his Lord of the Rings and of his other works. And uh, Sauron, if you keep up on all of this, Sauron actually was uh, known as a shapeshifter. Do you know what that is? He would, he would basically turn into different shapes so that he could be whatever he wanted to. And Tolkien's using Sauron, again, characterizing evil as a shapeshifter. Evil changes. You're saying, you lost me on the Tolkien thing, but I'm, I'm trying to hang with you, Pastor. Okay, let me give you something, something very, very, very real today. Everyone has a device, a mobile device. If you've got one, just hold it in your hand, just right here. Just show me. You got one. I got one. Yeah, mobile device, right? Yeah, you, you remember uh, like 20 plus years ago when I was like two, <laughs> I, I grew up with like a, a corded phone, right? You remember those corded phones? My sisters had had the long one because they were talking to boyfriends in the bathroom, right? You remember all that? Um, and and my, my first cell phone came with limited minutes. Do you remember that? And, and, and you had this huge antenna, and all it did was make phone calls. That's all it did. The, uh, now, a mobile device can do more things now than I could have ever imagined back in 1997, like, wherever I got my first one. Technology has solved a lot of problems. Wouldn't you agree? Lots of good problems. Some of you are like fact-checking me already on Isaiah. So you could do that on Google, right? You do all kinds of problems. But it's also created all kinds of new problems. Many of us are more secure than we've ever been before. We can watch our kids walk out of school and home or drive or where are you and we catch them, right? You know, like we can monitor our house and our bank account, but we're also vulnerable to identity theft. It happened to me last week. You know, somebody taking your information and hacking and using it. Uh, People using our information for wrong reasons. We're seeing it in the news now. Look, I can stay connected to my family but my device can also pull me away from my family when they need me. I know, Shay reminds me, okay? I can post a be real. If you don't know what it is, I'll have somebody explain this to you later that's under 30. If I can post a be real just to prove that I can be real, right? Or at least look like I'm being real, right? The question is, have these devices had had a net positive or a net negative on our society? Which have they been, positive or negative? How many people say positive? How many people say negative? How many people say, I don't like raising my hand. So, okay. (laughs) Again, why does this happen? Despite all the awesome things that technology can do, technology is not bad. It's what we do with it that's good or bad. But what happened? How come they haven't really helped us? Ultimately, it's the source of darkness that's within our own hearts. And evil is a shape shifter. Because the source of darkness is within us, advanced technology cannot change the heart, and it never will, just like politics. You cannot legislate morality. Technology just creates this new shape for the shadow of evil to fill. Listen, Martin Luther says that the human heart is bent in, curved in on itself, which basically means that we are radically self-absorbed. Take a look. We, We take little pictures called selfies. Usually on an iPhone. Sorry, Samsung and Android users, but iPhone. And post them on my Facebook. Interesting. Self-absorbed. Look, it creates all kinds of darkness and gives birth to all kinds of evil in each one of us. In our culture, in our society, there's crime and there's murder and there's rage and there's broken relationships. So Jesus had to deal with the root of our problem and our sin. And again, wipe away evil once and for all, and this is what he does. Now, some of you say, well, why didn't he just do it one time and then be done, and then there's no more evil and we're done? Think about that just for a second. If Jesus came right at 11 o'clock and wiped out evil at 11 o'clock, who would be here at 11.01? (laughs) Yeah, we wouldn't be here, right? 
So Jesus, again, he didn't come like we see in Revelation 20, 22. You remember seeing him with fire in his eyes? Remember that? The white hair, this glowing white hair on the horse? He comes actually not as that warrior to defeat our problems, but he comes as a baby who would be born like us to live the life we were supposed to live, to die the death that we were condemned to die so that we could be rescued from the curse of sin that's at work in each, each one of us, to break the power of sin once and for all. So the birth of Jesus defines, I want you to see this, the relationship he wants with you. Did you know that Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. He wants a relationship, and these are relational names that are given in Isaiah 9. Four of them, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. Wonderful counselor. We're just going to talk about that today. The word, in, there are two words in the, in the Hebrew as well. Pele Yahweh. Say that with me. Pele Yahweh. He doesn't play soccer. It's actually two words. Pele Yahweh. Pele means beyond understanding. Something way too amazing for words. You can't even describe it. It's awesomer than awesome. All right? I know awesomer isn't a word, but you try to find some words to describe him. That's Pele. Yahweh means counselor. One who advises, instructs, or guides from a position, ultimately, though, of authority. So let me give you a, a, a basic definition. Wonderful counselor. One beyond understanding who advises you from a position of authority. Isaiah says, a son will be given. God with us, he will be called Pele Yahweh's wonderful counselor. Say that with me, Pele Yahweh's. Remember that because you're going to need, if you don't already, a wonderful counselor. Now turn to Hebrews 4 in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews picks up on this counselor, this mediator, the high priest, he calls them. The high priest, ultimately, the mediator for us, between us and God. Hebrews 4, chapter 15. Four, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted, what? In every way. Just as, as we are, yet, what? He did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with, what? Confidence. So that we may receive and find grace to help us in our time of need. He's not just a king who rules over us. He's a brother who comes beside us, and lives among us. He became like us. He knew what it was to be hungry, to be hurt, to be cold, like you this morning, to be confined to a body that actually had limits. So what I want you to see is this truth, that Jesus understands you because he became like you. God became human. How is that possible? Theologians come up with all these terms. One of them is called the hypostatic union. Everybody say that with me. Hypostatic union. What, what is that? It's two natures in one person mixed forever. That's about as short as I can make it. The hypostatic union. It's also called the incarnation. God taking on flesh. Jesus being both God, perfectly divine, and man, human. And 100% human. Yet Hebrews says that he experienced what we experienced. That means he walked through everything that you've ever walked through. Think about this. He experienced whatever it is that you're experiencing right now. He knows loss. Listen, I know this to be true at Christmas. It's happening in my life. I wish there was someone else at the table this Christmas. Yesterday when I got this call from Perry... I ran into someone else, a young person in our, in our church here, working at the store. And this is her first Christmas without mom. And it hits me all the time when I see those of you who have lost your partner. And you know lost. And in fact, Christmas is really hard for you. And can I tell you that your Savior understands loss. And he's right with you in it. He may not be able to totally take away that pain and that grief that you're suffering, but he's with you. Somebody say, he knows. He knows. He understands you because he became like you. But why would Jesus ultimately do that to himself? Why would he get dirty and grimy in a stable that did not smell like cinnamon? Why would he do this? Why? So that he could bear the rejection and poverty that you and I deserved. 
So that when you come to him, you can come to him with what? With confidence, knowing that God's not going to judge you because all that judgment for your sin was laid on Jesus. Isaiah says, 53, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God. Listen, stricken by him and afflicted. But verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, and by his wounds we were healed. Or the punishment that brought peace, sorry, was upon him. He brought it all on him. And by his wounds we are healed. As your wonderful counselor, he understands you because he became human like you. Along that same line, he also, Jesus, sympathizes with you in your pain and your temptation. Some of you are struggling deeply about your pain and, and even in temptation. Listen, Jesus, he, he, is, he is this wonderful counselor that comes alongside you and listens sympathetically because there is no suffering or pain or confusion that you would go through that he has not gone through. He can guide you with expert advice. Again, Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. He's able, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, yet just as we are, yet he did not sin. Listen, some of you here today, if you were really honest, you're in quite a pickle. Your problems are huge. You're in a time of need. And you came to church and you were wondering why you should even come and the Holy Spirit brought you here. And he wants to speak to you in your time of need. Your greatest time to come to Christ is in a time of need. Wonderful counselor. The good news is that you have one who is here to help you this morning. He is to be our Pele Yahwetz, right? The wonderful counselor who came for people with problems just like you. I want you to see that Jesus guides you with expert advice. This wonderful counselor is not like this friend that you call up on Friday nights, and you're like, oh, man, I've just had such a hard week. It's been so tough. And that, that one lady, she's like, and the other person's on the other end like, yeah, oh, that's tough. That's hard. That's, yeah, I hate her too. No, that's not, that's not your counselor, right? That's not all. Again, some of you, you know this. You can bring your worst problems to him, and he shows you. He shows you how to work that out, and he walks with you in it, even though he may not solve it in the moment. Listen, Jesus conquered death in the grave. He gave the enemy of your soul a death blow. Don't you think he can handle your problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. He can get you through this. Part of why, listen, here's what I know about myself. Part of why we doubt is that we're not really sure that God is good. We have to settle that in your heart. God is good, and he's for you. Amen. He made you. He made you. And you're not really sure, though, how God feels about you. Many people feel this way because they think that God is holding on a grudge because of their sin or their lifestyle right now, and somehow they're disappoint that he's disappointed in them. So even when God blesses and even when God answers, they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Have you been there? Just waiting. Listen, the, the, the power that he gives you is the power and ability to see the gospel clearly. Listen, Jesus guides you and he gives you, what he gives you is no longer based on your merit because Jesus paid it all. He died in your place. What that means is that the other shoe dropped, but it dropped on him and he's taking care of it all. That's why you can come to him with confidence, you got to depend on his grace and trust him because Jesus knows exactly how to guide you out of the mess that you're in. You may not even know, ultimately, all the problems that are going to be faced with you, even in this next year, but he will reveal to you how he's weaving all these things together for your good and his purpose, ultimately. Now, I remember when my dad passed away in the hospital, and I prayed a prayer every single day. I was there with him, every, just praying this prayer, God, Heal him. God, heal him. God, heal him. God didn't heal my dad in this life, but he healed him for the life to come. That doesn't help my broken heart. It still grieves. And I talked to my mom. She still grieves. My sister's still grieving. My kid's still grieving the loss. But I know this. I will see him again someday. Amen. Wonderful counselor comes alongside you, and he speaks words of hope. 
But you've got to be open to his direction. You've got to be open to his word, the Bible, so that he can speak to you. So let me give you some guidance, if you will, just a few things. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. Some of you need these how-tos, so I'm going to give them to you. How can you get help from the wonderful counselor? First of all, be honest with him. Be honest. Some of you gone to counseling, right? Pretty common in our day for people to go to counseling, find a counselor, and you've got to be honest about your problems. It's one of the frustrating things for me as one who sees people and talks with them and does some of the pastoral counseling that I do is that people aren't always honest. But you've got to be honest. He can't help you with problems unless you're honest with them. Does it, is it that he doesn't know? No, it's about your confession. God, I need help. God, I need you. God, this is messed up in me. My thinking's not quite right here. My emotions are all over the place. We all have this tendency to want to keep the truth hidden. I'm not sure totally why. I think I know a few reasons why. One, we're afraid that if people really see who we are, they'll run away from us, including God. And oftentimes, we just like to carry around this character of who we are rather than down deep inside being real and being honest Being changed by Jesus ultimately doesn't happen 30 minutes. Did you know that? It's not like you can just take him to your house and say, Jesus, clean this up. I'll be back in two hours. (laughs) He actually works. He has to work with you. Some of you need to hear this. God wants to work with you this Christmas. You kind of think that when when your family gets together, it's like the Jerry Springer show. (laughs) Right? And you're kind of wondering, I, I, ho- I hope I don't see that. I don't, ha- I don't want that conversation. Maybe you're that person that they don't want to have the conversation with. And it's tough for you. But you've got to be honest with God. God, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with these dynamics. God, I'm coming to you. You've got to be able to share what's happening. The wonderful counselor is to be trusted. John 4 is a picture of the woman at the well. How many people have seen this, uh, what's that called? The chosen Yeah, The Chosen. How many people have seen The Chosen? If you have not seen The Chosen, I just encourage you to go see it. I know they take their liberties. It's not directly out of the scriptures, but it's a great representation of what it might have been like in terms of the New Testament. I encourage you to watch that if you have extra time this Christmas season. John 4, the woman at the well is sitting there, and Jesus knew before he even came her way the stuff that she was dealing with. She had been married five times. In fact, she was sleeping with another man, and he knew it. But he came to her anyway. Let that sink in. He knows you, and he's coming to you anyway because he loves you. Listen, there's nothing about you that's going to surprise him, nothing that hasn't already been covered by what Jesus did on the cross. Hallelujah. So come clean, confess, and admit, i got to be honest, God. This is where I'm at. Secondly, desire the healing that he offers you. I see this many times. In John 5, there's a story about a lame man. And he asked Jesus, do you want to be healed? Of course. Why does he ask such a silly question? Jesus is getting at this. Many people want God to clean up their mess without actually dealing with the choices and the patterns that got us into the mess. We just want God to rescue us and not have to deal with those consequences that come. And I see it a lot. People like the idea of change, but not really sure they want to do the work of change. A friend of mine used to say, Ronnie... Now, you can't call me Ronnie because he's a close friend. <laughs> Ronnie, you got to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. I hated him when he said that. Why? Because he was right. I wasn't tired enough of being sick and tired. So until you get to that place, when you're ready, God is here. Here's the question. Do you really want change? Jesus can heal you. He can. Do you really want it? He can heal you. Lastly, I want you to see, be ready to do what he says. Be ready to do what he says. As we've gone through the Bible in the last year, the New Testament showed us over and over again, some of you remember this, Jesus is is always asking people to do crazy things, right? Crazy things. John 9, he spits on the ground, he makes some mud, and he puts it on a blind man's eyes. Do you guys remember that story? Puts it on his eyes, but what's really curious about this story, aside from making mud pies and all that, uh, is that he has him wash off at a pool but a specific pool that's all the way across town. Why does he have him go all the way across town? There's water nearby. Why does he have him do that? Why not just heal him on the spot? Another time when Peter, Peter needed money for taxes. Do you remember this one? Jesus said, go out in the fish. You'll find the, the, the money in the, in the fish's mouth. Just the right amount to pay these taxes. I'm, I'm praying for that this year. I'm praying for <laughs> this year. Like, 
Jesus, again, this is what happens. Why doesn't he just pull out a coin from behind like Peter's ear and say, here. Jesus is showing us that sometimes obedience doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense according to our culture, especially obeying God. Because when he tells you to forgive, what you really want is revenge. It doesn't seem to make sense. When he tells you to end the relationship, but you're scared of being alone, it doesn't make sense. Tells you to give, even though you don't know where it's going to come from, and you're afraid you won't have enough, you can't afford it, doesn't make sense. Tells you to stop sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, but you don't want to lose them, it doesn't make sense. That actually reveals to you a lack of trust in the wonderful counselor. Do you really trust him? Do you really believe that he's good and that he's for you? Then be ready to do what he says That's what a disciple following Jesus actually does. A disciple actually says, Jesus, I'm saying yes to you before you even ask. Before you even say it, I'm going to live according to your word. I'm going to be a person of the book, and I've been praying for us that we would be people of the book. I give up my prerogative to choose Jesus. I let your word guide me, not something I add to it or take away from it. And some people have a really hard time to do this. I know it's, it's hard because in a culture where we say, well, did Jesus really say that? And then we reword his words. That's not what God wants for you. Whenever God says don't, you know what he's saying? Don't hurt yourself. Don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. And sometimes we get confused like, like he's taking our will and, and choosing for us. And somehow we're losing power. But the secret to the Christian life and power in the Christian life is called surrender, folks. Surrender. Like the rich young ruler, some of you, you have everything. And God comes to you. The rich rich young ruler uh, came to Jesus and said, you know, what must I do? What else can I do to earn my way? Really is what he's getting at. What, What do I have to do? I've got everything. And Jesus says, sell all your possessions and give to the poor. What was his response? Do you remember? He walked away sad. He couldn't do it. And really it comes down to it. Are you willing to surrender it all? This is the life that Jesus is calling you to. Surrender. Come to him. God, you know better than I do. I'm sorry. I've been playing God way far too long than I should have been. And now I come to you and I surrender my life to you. Are you willing to be honest with him? Do you really want to be healed? Are you ready to do whatever it takes The great part about this season that I'm reminded about Jesus is that it's not that that he solves all my problems, but that he's actually with me in the middle of my problems. He sent me a helper. He put me in a family. People who love me. And God does this for each one of us. And then I see how wonderful he is despite going through my problems. Do you understand? His presence with you is far better than any of the solutions that you're looking for. Amen? Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you're in a pickle, you have a problem. Nobody looking around, just you and me. I want to pray for you. You're saying, I've got a problem and I'm willing to come to Jesus right now. I'm humbling myself. I'm surrendering right here. I'm going to do it his way. I've been doing it my way for a long time, but today I'm doing it his way. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, you're in line for a miracle. Come on. Anyone else? Yes. In the courtyard. Yes, yes, yes. Let's pray. Father, you know that we are a problematic people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you right now in this room. Holy Spirit, you're working in ways that Ron Marsh never could do. You're working on the heart. So we just pray, Lord, as we come to you and surrender that you would fill us, God, that you would comfort us, wonderful counselor, that you would come alongside and heal and restore, God, in Jesus' name. You would give words to speak to family members, God. You would restore relationship. You would take the brokenness, the hole that exists, and fill it with you. And Father, if that solution doesn't turn out the way that we want it, Father, we confess we are going to hang on to you and look at the wonder that you provide us 
and being our counselor. Father, just be with this church. God, we pray in these days ahead that we could share this message to people who are hurting outside these walls to let them know that you've come, Jesus. You've come for people with problems. Thank you for your love for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're really struggling today, I'm gonna offer this to you. I know Shay and I will be up here. We'll ask some of our leaders if they're willing to pray with you. I gotta say this, something happens when people pray. (laughs) God moves. And you can solidify that commitment today that I'm looking for change. I'm wanting God to solve, yes, but I'm willing to work with him. And we'll be up here after the service. Let's sing, let's stand and sing this next song.